Thank you so much. I'm, I'm Dr. Mark Lewis, uh, the Executive Director of NDIA's Emerging Technologies Institute. And this is Emerging Technology Horizons, our podcast where we explore various issues and aspects related to emerging technologies and especially their impact on national defense. Uh, with me today is the incredibly awesome Dr. Pavi Alal. Uh, Pavi and I have been friends for, for quite some time. We work together at the Institute for Defense Analyses. Right now, uh, Pavi is the acting chief of staff at NASA. Uh, that makes her the senior White House appointee at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Um, Pavi also served on the transition team where she supported the team that was not only uh, uh, helping to, to, to set up uh, NASA for the administration, but also uh, working in the Pentagon as well. Um, she has many, many credentials, uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees in nuclear engineering from MIT, um, PhD from George Washington University. Uh, but I think she is extremely well known as, as frankly, one of the world's foremost experts in, in, in space policy. I mean, Pavia literally helped establish our nation's space policy directions. And so it's, it's amazing to see you now at NASA where you get to implement many of the policies that you helped develop and you, you helped to write. And I just got to say the nation couldn't be in more capable hands. So, so Pavia, thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time today. Mark, it's my honor. It's my privilege. Uh, I mean, your words were too kind. I mean, you have lost more brain cells than most people have ever had. So, so yeah, so we, <laughs> everything I know, I learned from you. So uh, it's just been an extraordinary uh, journey together with you at Stippy. And of course, I'm so excited to be here at NASA. Very good. Well, well Pavi, if, if I can jump in, you know, again, you, you, you're one of our, our, our foremost thinkers on, on space policy. And, and, and you know, you help formulate many of the opinions and, and many of the positions uh, that, that have now, you know, become the centerpiece of, 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 of our national, national space portfolio. Um, could you comment a little bit about how your past experiences have, have informed the work in your new position? And, and what you've been able to bring to your role as, as NASA Chief of Staff? Sure. So as as you know well, uh, as a director of STIPI, you established some of the policies that allowed us to do the kind of work we did. So because of its reputation for being unbiased and, and data-driven, we really got to dive deeply into some of the most important technology and policy issues in the space sector. So for example, you know, how does one expand commercial activities in space? How does How do you lower the cost of space? When can the United States get to Mars? Um, is it possible to mine asteroids commercially? You know, are there commercial prospects for the moon? How do you how do you commercialize low Earth orbit? And you know, I can just go on to a litany of questions that we got asked by our various sponsors, including you know the White House, uh, NASA, Department of Defense, intelligence community. And at the core of what we did was uh, how do we make government more efficient and effective? And in so many ways, this is what we I'm bringing to NASA with me, right? Not just topically, and you know, I mentioned a bunch of topics we we touched, but also from a methods perspective. How do, how do you make sure your analyses aren't as politically motivated? How do you make sure that they remain analytical? Um, and I guess in terms of how it informed my work, I'm not just at the you know because I've been able to learn so much about these topic areas. I'm not just at the mercy of experts who may have a point of view, however valid. You know, I can see the other side. I can see when findings are not as data driven. And, you know, to some extent, uh, this has helped me identify some of the biggest challenges that NASA faces. And it's going to be a hard, hard time addressing them, but it's good to have a good start. Yeah, indeed. and of course, you, you know, you're, you, I think you're finding that that it's 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 a different experience from in doing the analysis and providing the advice and and now actually being in the center seat and making the decisions. Um, yeah, it's yeah. I mean, there is really nothing I can bring from my analytical past to to address that bit. So uh, that's a, you know that's a, a challenge every single day, and I often challenge you know folks like yourselves who were you know at the top of the R and E organization at DoD to see how to do it. So thanks for showing us the way. <laughs> I'm not sure that's an example you want to follow, but but absolutely. So you you know you mentioned you mentioned DoD and and of course I I spent some of my career in in, in the Pentagon 
and 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 you know we were always very eager to work with with our civilian counterparts and especially you know when I was with the Air Force we built really close ties with NASA NASA had reached out to us we reached out to the Air we reached out to the, to NASA um, and then, you know most recently I was I was I was back in R and E and and we were interacting with NASA and I'm wondering could could you comment a little bit about how civilian space influences national defense what do you see as the role of NASA uh, in regard to uh, the Pentagon uh, how should it be working together. Uh, great question, Mark. I mean, I just want to maybe start uh, to, to you know clarify that NASA is a strictly civilian agency. An example being human spaceflight, a unique mechanism to build global alliances, and and you know show that the United States is a world leader. Um, uh, um, actually, our, our our work with uh, uh, Russia in the last twenty plus years has been uh, one of the areas where we we have been able to uh, demonstrate how. You know how we could work with an adversary um, uh, uh, in space, and where we have common interests. And you know, we have you know effectively modeled this behavior and interaction with lunar science. And you know, there has been you know uh, new openness and sharing of lunar mission data, including return samples of the moon for analysis by the international community. Um, I mean, on the technology development front, NASA has extraordinary uh, uh, synergies with the national security. Community, um, uh, though, I mean, again, to clarify, we clearly focus on civil applications. Examples include space, nuclear power, and propulsion. You know, NASA needs to go uh, to the moon with humans. Uh, NASA needs power on the moon for uh, activities like ISRU, um, and so we are wanting to develop some of these technologies. And and DoD may have you know needs uh, 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 other needs, and but but the technology base is common. You know, the fuel forms we use, for example. Uh, uh, opportunities to have synergies. Now, I was going to ask if, if the establishment of the Space Force has changed the relationship. Has it made it easier to work with the department? Has it has it impacted the? Is it too early to tell? So NASA has signed a, a, a memorandum of agreement with the with Space Force. So that's a really great start to start to collaborate. I mean, with that umbrella agreement some of the working level relationships get easier. And that's really, really important to know that the leadership has commitment to this collaboration. Uh, it may be a little bit too early to tell, you know, we do meet occasionally. So for example, we have a summit coming up with the leadership of Space Force, and we will be discussing topics such as a space nuclear power and propulsion, uh, science, you uh, know, joint uh, or, or common science and technology areas. One of the common areas is on orbit servicing assembly and manufacturing. You know, NASA has huge civil applications for uh, this, but some of the core technologies are common to both uh, DOD and NASA. And actually one thing that's really important that's common is um, is the industrial base, right? You know, the workforce, the supply chains, those are things that we really need to work together to strengthen. Right, right. By the way, I want to inject, interject here. There's, everyone is talking today about OSAM, orbital uh, supply and manufacturing. Uh, I think you actually coined that term. I'm going to give you credit on that. I think you were the first person who used that term. So, so. <laughs> this is true. This is true. We were just we just couldn't say it was such a mouthful to say that whole set of phrases. And you were so kind to 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 yeah. you know allow us to use it. So thanks thanks are due yeah. to you as well. It was, it was definitely gone. You know, very very good. But I, I, I really appreciate your comments about about the space force and great to hear that that NASA and the space force are are interacting. I you know always thought if if you know. If, on the, just from the standpoint of, of, of the taxpayer getting the, the best bang from 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 their tax dollars, uh, those sorts of relationships are extremely extremely important. Um, you know, of course, both both NASA and the Department of Defense are trying to leverage a larger segment of the commercial space uh, industry. And you know, in the last few years, you know, one of the great stories in space has been this this rise of of of, of what are termed commercial. Commercial space companies, more small companies, sometimes called new space. I personally don't like that term, uh, but but it's it, it's it's entered the, the popular jargon. You you've done a lot of work looking at at the potential for the space economy, the size of the space economy, um, um, opportunities in the space economy. Could you comment on the potential for for commercial space, and what does it mean for both NASA and also for the Department of Defense? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's the word of the day, right? Commercial says everything is commercial, you know, a new space. And I think at the, at the heart of it is a, a new 
a, a new uh, paradigm of thinking. So, so privately owned and operated launch, for example, reflects a profound shift already underway in the space sector for a long time. As you know, well, this is something that is not new, despite the words, you know, we have had commercial activities in the space sector since the 1980s. However, what is happening now is the privatization of functions that were previously considered inherently governmental. Um, and, 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 you know, whether it's SpaceX launching human beings, and I'm wearing my, uh, I'm in Florida and Orlando, uh, waiting for tomorrow morning for the launch of Commercial uh, Crew 2, where we will launch two American astronauts and uh, a French and a, a Japanese astronaut to the space station. So, you know, this is an absolute success of NASA's activities to commercialize space, right? First, they uh, funded R&D for, for multiple companies, and then they uh, signed service contracts. So in principle, we have two companies today that are providing uh, uh, just basically ferrying services for contracts and crew to, to, to the space station. And that's an absolute success of the U.S. government's effort to privatize space. Um, and, and basically, the program successes show that these solutions-oriented contracting approaches can reduce the total cost of development um, as compared with cost plus contracts. And it really does incentivize to engineer systems that are cheaper to produce and operate in order to generate profits. And actually, it's a win-win in lots of ways, right? It approaches, it, it, uh, the approach reduces cost of government. As a private sector now takes over some of the burden of developing, maintaining, and operating space infrastructure, the government doesn't need to own any space technology systems. I mean, basically, you know, NASA just purchased a ticket. Uh, to a destination. Um, but second, and actually this is more important, because private entities have made investments in and now own space systems and the underlying technologies and the IP, they are motivated to find customers other than the government, as well as develop other new and lower cost applications for these uh, products and services. The traditional aerospace sector does not have these in in inducements, right? I mean, they're incentivized to fulfill government contracts, and not even on time or budget, since you know, in many cases there is yeah. no major penalty for for missing deadlines. Yeah. So and then the reward you get more money. That's right. That's yeah. right. And and of course, uh, what this does is it frees up money. So for NASA, again speaking for NASA, now we have more money to put the the first woman and the second woman. You know, I always you always hear the first woman and the next man. I'm like, I can't the second person be a second woman. So I, I like to say the first uh, uh, and you know on to, to the moon and ultimately go to Mars. So it seems it seems like this is a win win and, and um DOD has been absolutely um part of this movement as well. I mean some of the earliest funds that went to SpaceX were from DARPA, right? So I, I think DOD right, right, has right. absolutely been a leader in trying to uh, you know, make parts of what is inherently governmental private, uh, but you know, it's a, it's a big ship, and sometimes it's hard to move big ships. It is. You know, we we, we often joked in the Pentagon about trying to steer the aircraft carrier. It's got a lot of inertia, but but yeah, it's it's. I, I agree with you. Quite a, quite quite a profound change in the way we do things. I say, as as an engineer, I'm I'm struck by the the idea. You know, especially aerospace engineers, we always try to optimize the system. You know, maximize performance. You want to minimize weight on any aerospace system. And the idea of optimizing not for performance per se, but optimizing for low costs is 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 an intriguing notion as well. Right. I think Ex exactly. And I think CubeSats are a perfect example of that. Right. Uh, small satellites. They are. Uh, not as you know, they, 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 you sacrifice performance, you sacrifice reliability, but you get low cost, so you can launch more of them. And again, now we are kind of learning that maybe there's a downside to that as well. We are really, you know, <laughs> littering our sky with with tens of tons of satellites. Right. So there are some issues there. But 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 to your point, yes, there is a trade off that uh, that we didn't make to the extent that we are starting to make now, and I think that's a good thing. Right. Now, you know, earlier you talked about international partnerships. Uh, you talked about the space station and a partnership with Russia, even even when when relations were were, were, were uh, stretched between our two nations, we maintain that 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 partnership. Tell me a little bit about space as, as an instrument of soft power. Um, how, how, how does it help us build alliances? Of, how, how does it project a, a positive image of, of the United States to the rest of the world? Yeah, I mean, uh, awesome question, Mark. I just think that space is essentially the pinnacle of how you demonstrate leadership. Uh, I think it was Eisenhower who said something to the effect of, and uh, um, you know, I can, I can, I should look this up. That you know, 
a leader in space is a leader in the world, essentially, is what he was saying. And um, and it isn't just from the times of Apollo that you see that. I mean, today, uh, just a few months ago, we landed the Mars Perseverance rover, right? I mean, the 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 extraordinary feedback from the rest of the world demonstrating, uh, and you know, we did that in the open, right? We we weren't sure if it would work. We didn't hide data. We didn't we and or the Mars Ingenuity helicopter. You know, we had challenges, right? It took you know three or four extra days, but we did it publicly. So in a way, we are saying, hey. We have the ingenuity, we have the innovation, and come join us. And that's what I think leadership is. For uh, And a really good example is the Artemis program and the Artemis Accord. So so what we want to be doing is, is, is uh, working on a global basis to establish norms of behavior in space. You know, uh, this is, you know, our, this is an imperative as a leader that, you know, what we do in space is a, is a model for the, what the rest of the world does in space. You know, we don't go to Antarctic first and establish exclusionary zones, economic exclusionary zones. And we wouldn't want it if other countries, say China, were to do that on the moon. So it's 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 kind of important that NASA has that leadership role, whether it's through uh, civil, civilian Artemis Accord sort of uh, roles or, or on the national security side or broader uh, uh, norms of agreement, uh, norms of behavior in space. Uh, and uh, this is something we have shown not just in deep space. We have shown this in Earth observation. We freely share our data with the rest of the world. And um, uh, we we try to make sure that we bring partners along with us. So we have really amazing relationships with ESA, the European Space Agency, or JAXA. And, and these are countries that are putting in money. So when we build the Lunar Gateway in Cislunar Space, uh, JAXA is you know coming as a full partner. And, 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 and collaborating. And I think it's really, uh, space is expensive, space is hard, and we need international partnerships to be able to do what we want to do. And um, by being good role models, by being open, um, sharing data freely, we show we are the leaders. And it's, it's, uh, it's bearing fruit. Now we have countries like the United Arab Emirates, UAE, that wants to partner with us on the station, on the uh, in cislunar space, so so um, and our good work is is is, is uh, leading to good benefits. Well, I, I I love I love those examples. I I personally often thought that one of the most profoundly significant moments in our nation's history was when when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. Of course, that of course in itself was a profound moment. But he could have stepped off the lunar module and said, "I claim this moon in the name of the United States of America." He didn't. He said, "We came in peace for all mankind." And establish that norm, and, and so I, I I love that point that you just made that we're 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 setting basically setting setting these standards, setting these precedents for behavior in in in, in space. Um, you know, of course, um, you know, switching gears a little bit, there there are there are some defense implications in in, in space, and the Department of Defense, of course. I mean, we got Space Force. Uh, space is, is is rapidly becoming an area that that we worry about being contested. And, and you know, one of, the, one of the things the department is trying to do, in fact, it was part of my job when I was in the Pentagon, was trying to accelerate the pace of delivery of emerging technologies um, across the board, and including space. And, Mona, you know, you, you talked about some of the successes that, that NASA has had leveraging uh, the uh, commercial space. Are there lessons learned that you think the Department of Defense can learn, that can, can, can pick up from NASA? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I would probably like to just start by saying that, um... Uh, the Na- NASA and DoD have b- have been good collaborators from from the early days. Even the even the predecessor of NASA, the NACA, uh, DoD was a collaborator, and and we shared technology developments with each other and with commercial partners. Um, NASA's early human space f- flight program was born from military launch vehicles and ICBM programs, right? So, uh, and today NASA space technologies continue to be infused in and leveraged by military and commercial space programs. So. So, so we have had good examples of collaboration. Uh, in terms of uh, lessons for uh, for DoD, I mean, I think uh, I mean we I, I I I think we're all we're all learning, but I think speed is one that we would like to you know we we would like to be better at, and that's something that I think uh, especially through the COTS program. Uh, or, or some of the space technology programs that uh, that NASA has funded. Um, um, uh, one one that we are pretty proud of is when you know later this year we will upgrade the ISS solar panels with a, with Rosa technology, 
And again, this was something that was done very quickly with the private sector. Um, uh, you know, Maxar partnered with us on the deployable space systems on the power and propulsion element of the gateway. Uh, again, something, you know, some very creative contracting mechanisms were used. And again, these are some of these, I mean, these things have to be learned over time. NASA has special contracting, you know, uh, 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 other transaction authority kind of privileges, but DOD has those as well. And it almost depends on um, on the forward leaning nature of, of those, of the leaders. You know, if we really want to get something done, how do we make sure that you know, we obviously follow all the you know rules and regulations, but but we we try to not just say, hey, these rules are holding us back. We cannot do X because you know, look at the FAR Part 50 or whatever. You just kind of need to try to lean forward, and I think NASA has been able to do that pretty well. And again, commercial cargo and crew are good examples of that. But I wouldn't say DoD is is um, is. Uh, I mean, DoD has been a role model for the for for NASA in many different ways. So I think. Uh, I think we're all learning and, and teaching each other. So um, it's um, uh, it's just that we just need to move faster and faster. Our adversaries are not um, are not interested in the sorts of things we are. Transparency, accountability, if, uh, and when you are looking at some of those things, which are so 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 fundamental to our nation, um, once in a while, efficiency and effectiveness does kind of uh, get a lower. Is sort of lower rating, so 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 there is a balance there, but it is. Uh, but in the Cold War days, I think we had a lot more. You know, we were just so much farther ahead than our adversary of the time. We could afford to make some of these mistakes and you know keep you know slow down, go forward, go back. But I think in the in the twenty first century environment, we have a lot less give in the system, and we really need to try harder to address some of our, our challenges related to if you know effect, effectiveness and efficiency of our contracting. Um, mechanisms, for example. You know, I love your point. I remember when you and I worked at SIFI together, we were occasionally asked what new authorities, what new regulations could be put in place to speed up various processes. And we almost invariably came back with the answer, we don't need any new authorities. We had everything we needed. It just it was just cultural, getting people to, to use the rules and use use the existing uh, construct more more effectively. So so I'm, I, 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 I agree with you completely on that. Um, Pavi, our, our, our time is winding down, but before we go, you know, you, you mentioned you mentioned um, uh, the inspirational nature of, of the work that NASA is doing, and you know, most recently, you know, our, our, the current Mars mission having a, a helicopter on on the moon. That one is actually near and dear to my heart because about almost 20 years ago, the American Helicopter Society did a student design competition for a helicopter that would fly on Mars. And you know, when I, when I was at the University of Maryland, we had a student team. Georgia Tech also had a student team, and these students designed a Mars helicopter and showed it could be done. And, and they were working with NASA at the time, NASA Ames, and I think JPL pick. So what what are NASA's roles and responsibilities to, in inspiring you know, the, the next generation of scientists and, and, and engineers, just as we were inspired by the accomplishments of, of, of the earlier space program? So, yeah, so uh, Mark, I cannot emphasize how important this role that NASA has. Um, uh, and actually, before I even go on to that, I wanted to mention something that is only now becoming public just yesterday or the day before, uh, a small experiment called MOXIE produced the first oxygen on a different planetary surface. So we have now conducted ISRU on Mars, um, uh, in, in situ resource utilization. We have, we, have, we have five grams of oxygen that this machine uh, developed and, and again one of those mind blowing innovations that that get just the whole world excited and and uh, NASA has a STEM education office and then obviously you know STEM education is infused across across NASA uh, uh, the administration has asked for uh, uh, large amounts of STEM STEM funding and I'm hoping that uh, we will you know it will be appropriated. Um, uh, we have a program called uh, space, you know, space Grant Consortium that allows for a lot of space pro, uh, STEM programs for, for students. Uh, the Perseverance Landing that I mentioned earlier, the Countdown to Mars Challenge, had over a million students watching the, the, the landing live. Uh, in a space grant, as I mentioned, uh, is, um, you know, has you know, almost 1,000, maybe 850 affiliates from universities and and science centers and, and uh, museums and state and local agencies. So, uh, so between the specific educational programs that NASA has, as well as the education components of all of the scientific projects that we 
that we invest in, uh, we in, we have to absolutely ensure, and you know, we we do that, and we need to do more of that. We in, not, need to in, ensure the incorporation of not just uh, college students, but lifelong learners. You know, K twelve uh, across the realm. I mean, there's nothing that excites the uh, excites the future generation more than the vision of you know doing you know settling space, becoming a multi multi planet space faring species, uh, living and working in space. These are the sorts of things that inspire minds. They certainly inspired me. I grew up with Star Trek and uh, uh, I watched, you know, I, as, a, as a very small child, I watched the moon landing and those are the sorts of things that inspire and engage and we need to just keep doing more and more of that. Fantastic. Dr. Pavel, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. And, and thank you for your service to the nation. I said I can't imagine someone, anyone more qualified to, 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 to be in the leadership of, our, of, of, of NASA, uh, given your incredible background and incredible contributions. So, so thank, thanks so much. Well, no, thanks to you, Mark. You've not only been a mentor to me, but you've been a mentor to so many hundreds of students and and professionals around the world. So, so what you do is so important for the rest of the country and the world. Thank you.